Good morning, church family. We're so glad you are gathered together at uh, this beautiful Sunday morning. We are praying for you. We're praying for Pastor Brian as he preaches. Uh, and we pray that your fellowship is sweet. We are in the village of Hor, Egypt. This is the church that we're standing in of Samir's grandfather. He planted this church, pastored it for many years in the 1800s into the early 1900s. Then his dad was a pastor here. And then Samir went on to train as a chemist then eventually came to America. But this is where he was raised. And this is the church we've been administering in all week long. We have been preaching and teaching and training with some of the sweetest, godless people. We have truly enjoyed our time here, and we praise God that the church sends us to do these things. Um, it, the videos and the pictures that we're going to show you in return uh, can only show, show just a, a small amount of what life is like here. Uh, it is amazing, and it is difficult. But with all that said, there is a group of people here who really, truly love Christ and love his word. And they are brothers and sisters, and we have enjoyed our time here. We look forward to maybe many more trips and bringing others here to encourage this group. Uh, so we ask you that you would pray for this church. They will be gathering this morning, too, and they will be singing worship songs and preaching God's word. Uh, it'll be a different culture and a different language, but the same truth. So what a joy to be here. Thank you for sending us. Uh, we're doing well. We're a little tired, uh, but that's a good tire. Uh, and but we are looking forward to coming home and sharing all that we've learned and all that we've seen with you. Have a great worship service. We'll talk to you very soon. We love you and we miss you. Amen. Well, let's continue to pray for Pastor Scott as he ministers God's truth and God's word over in North Africa. Now for us, let's turn our attention to the word of God this morning. I'm going to be reading from some selected scripture verses out of John chapter 1. And in John, Christ is talking, or uh, John himself is talking about Christ. So let me read this beginning with verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory... Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Church, we are here to worship because Christ becoming flesh, dying on a cross, and now ascending to the right hand of the Father, we have received grace upon grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of the gospel. We thank you that we can come and worship you this morning. I pray that you would prepare our hearts, help us to be attentive and focused upon what only matters in this world, and that's your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a joy it is to be with you this morning, church. Why don't you stand your, your feet this morning as we do sing about that grace on top of grace. Top 
testify this morning, church, about God's grace. for God's grace this morning, church. Your 
just a moment after the reading of scripture. We'll have the opportunity to, to give, give cheerfully to the Lord his work here through Riverbend and around the world with missionaries we support. There's, there are boxes on the walls, baskets will be passed, online's an option, those viewing online, uh, instructions are given as well. And so take that opportunity to give. Our reading today is the letter of Paul to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person that is sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was with was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord, refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. You may be seated. And let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. This letter you inspired Paul to write to Philemon. Anoint Pastor Brian as he preaches from it today. Open our hearts to your truth. Pray your spirit would work in us to transform us for your glory. And Lord, to draw those not yet in Christ to faith. Now bless our time of giving as well. May we be faithful to serve you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning. Uh, we have a few family matters just wanted to uh, put before you. And I say, as I announce these things, I just wanted to really encourage you to read your bulletins because they have all the details of all these announcements we give. But sometimes we just want to make sure that certain things are prominent in your mind because coming up this Wednesday, uh, we're going to be uh, giving you an opportunity to contribute to Thanksgiving baskets that go out to people who are needy. Uh, it's a special opportunity not just to give them a meal, but also to share the gospel with uh, different families that we have connections with. Um, so they'll be starting to provide tables in that Bible hall. Yes, yes. Okay. I have another announcement. <laughs> Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so we also need people that would be helping in sorting and delivering those baskets. And it's not just dropping them off, but you have an opportunity to talk with people who are in need and share Christ. Uh, we have fall fellowship coming up in less than three weeks. And it's Friday, November the 18th from 5 to 8 p.m. It'll be right here on the campus. We need volunteers to sign up. You can also sign up today in the Bible Hall, which is that hall that goes right back there between those two doors. We call it the Bible Hall because there's lots of pictures and uh, actually displays of Bibles in there. If you've never looked at that, it's just an amazing thing. Uh, then we have the River Bend Christmas Banquet coming up December 2nd at 6 p.m. right here in the Worship Center. And Dr. Ernie Baker of Fellowship by, of uh, First Baptist Church in Jacksonville will be our speaker. He's written a book, uh, many things in counseling, uh, one particularly uh, Mary Wisely, Mary Well, good, good book for uh, your teens to read before they consider marriage or anybody as well. Uh, uh, Hayward was just telling me that we'd like you to help us to stack the chairs right after the service today. That would be greatly helpful. Okay, well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer before we enter into studying his word. Father, thank you for the many truths that we have sung, the opportunity we have to be together to worship you. We are so grateful that you have given us all of the promises of Scripture. Thank you for those who lead us in worship, Lord. We thank you that you provided songs for us to sing so that we can 
display our hearts to you, that we love you, that we're grateful for you, that we are thankful for our salvation. We're thankful for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit who alone can empower us and who can change our lives through the preaching and the teaching and the reading and the mutual exhortation and admonition from God's word. And Father, we we come to you for those that might be in need of refreshment today. And we ask that you would comfort our hearts in Christ Jesus. Pray that you'll give peace to those who are in turmoil. Pray that you give solutions to uh, those that are finding trials difficult to bear and not seeing an end to the trial. We pray, Lord, that you would stimulate us as we are together to love and good deeds. We thank you that you have gathered each person here today, and we pray that you would minister to their hearts. In Christ's name we pray, amen. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. For I will satisfy the weary soul. Every languishing soul I will replenish. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If you've been a believer for very long, you know that that is a collection of passages of scripture that are very encouraging. They've comforted the hearts of many believers. And in these passages, the Lord characterizes us as wanting and weary and languishing and waiting and weak and needy and in need of rest. We're tired, we're weighed down, and we're wayward. But he promises that if we will come to him, we will find provision. Satisfaction, strength and vigor, assurance and rest and restoration and refreshment. My goal this morning is to refresh your hearts and to enable you to be a refreshment to other people. Our text comes from this little 25-verse letter from Paul to his beloved friend Philemon. Paul's in prison for preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And while in prison, he apparently met this man named Onesimus. He shared the gospel with him, and he says that I beget him. He was my child in the faith. He became a Christian. And this... Child in the faith has been ministering to Paul's needs in some way. Perhaps he has been released and he is bringing food to him or giving him physical help or even medical. But it turns out that Onesimus is a runaway slave. He was owned by Philemon. And he apparently ran away and even perhaps stole some things from Philemon. And so Paul thinks that the right thing to do is to send him back. And he even tells 
Philemon that if he has anything that's a charge against him, if he's taken anything, if he owes you anything, then charge it to my account. <clears throat> but Paul asks Philemon, will you receive him back not as a slave, but as a brother? What a powerful thing the gospel does. When he receives Onesimus back, Paul says that he will be receiving his very heart. He sees, he loves Onesimus so much that he calls him his very heart. And by doing this, Paul says in verse 20, the second half, that he will refresh his heart in Christ. So as Paul begins this letter, he does a very encouraging thing. He tells Philemon the reasons that he is thankful for him. Listen to verses 4 through 7. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers. Because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. <clears throat> for I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love. Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. You can see three relationships going on here. Paul is refreshing Philemon's heart by telling him that he has heard encouraging things about him. Doesn't that refresh your heart when somebody says to you, Hey, I've just heard good things about you. I heard this. Somebody shared this about you, about how you shared your faith or, or how you were persevering through a trial or, or how you blessed somebody else's heart because you comforted them or you did this good deed towards them. And, and not that we do it for the recognition of men, but God has designed us in such a way that just as he loves our praise, we love praise as well. It's encouraging to receive thanks, isn't it? So Paul's a great example of that, but he also tells us that Philemon has refreshed the hearts of the saints. So Paul is refreshing Philemon. Philemon has refreshed the hearts of the saints, and the saints have refreshed Paul by telling him about Philemon. So we have this mutual cycle of encouragement going on and refreshing hearts. Beautiful picture. And Paul asked Philemon if he would refresh his heart by receiving his heart embodied in the person of Onesimus. There's a powerful statement in Proverbs 11.25 which tells us that whoever refreshes Others will be refreshed. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So from Philemon verses 4 through 7 today, I want to show you five ways that you can refresh the hearts of the believers that you know. And in turn, your heart will be refreshed as well. The first way to refresh people's heart is simply to pray for them. To pray for them. In verse 4, Paul says to Philemon, I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers. That's encouraging, isn't it? To know that somebody's praying for you. 
I mean, if somebody's praying for you, it might refresh your heart and you don't even know why. But it's because somebody's praying for you. But to tell somebody that you're praying for them is encouraging, isn't it? It refreshes people's hearts. And so he's doing this to Philemon. He is, uh, he's, he's doing this amazing encouragement, really. It, it really is powerful when somebody tells you that they're praying for you. Because that means not only that they, they, they thought about you, but they loved you and cared enough about you and what you are going through to talk to God about it. That you've come up in that person's conversation with God. My relationship with God involves you. Wow. It's so easy to have negative thoughts about people, isn't it? We all still sin as Christians, and the people who sin against us easily get put in the things I'm ungrateful for category. But we have to put that off. We have to put that behind us. We must begin to be thankful for the people that God has providentially put into our lives. There is no person in your life that God didn't ordain would be there. You believe that? Hard to imagine sometimes. God, you must have made a mistake with that guy. Wow, could we say such a thing? God never makes mistakes, does he? He is infinitely wise and he knows what it takes to encourage you. He knows what it takes to change you to be more in conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. And the people are part of that. People are God's gift to you. Let me ask you to do this, to, to take inventory, to just think for a moment about the people God placed in your life, especially believers. Now, you can pray for all people, but especially think tonight or this morning about uh, the believers God has placed in your life. Perhaps some family members, some teachers, some pastors, some, some friends in church, people that are in your BFG or in your community group or in your small group. God has placed each one of those people in your life as a gift for you to be mutually beneficial to one another. And when you think of these people, just begin to pray to the Lord about them. And it is a powerful thing when you just start think, thanking God for them. You know, I just, I thank God for Jimmy, you know, or Bob, or Gertrude. Whoever it is that is in your life, just think about them for a moment and just start thanking God for them. Lord, I thank you for this person. I thank you that they are such an example to me in this particular way. I thank you for the trial they're going through, which enabled me to come alongside them and help and minister with them. I thank you for the encouragement they are to me. I even thank you for the challenge because it's sharpening me. I thank you for this conflict that we're having because I know it's a way that I can glorify you better. But it's just start to think about how you can be thanked for that person. And it changes your whole perspective. It makes you more Christ-centered. It makes you more dependent upon the Holy Spirit. It makes you think, that, think of that person in a way that you can love them better. It will change you. And then do what Paul does here. Tell them. Tell people you're thankful for them. I'm thankful for you, sister. I'm thankful for you, brother. And I pray for you. And I thank God for you. Just that little thing will refresh the hearts of the saints. 
Affirmation is powerful, and it goes a long way to develop friendships. Now, what we see here in this verse, though, by Paul's example, is that we need to have times of prayer. If you're going to say that to somebody, that I'm th- I thank God for you when I make mention of you in my prayers, that means you've got to pray, <laughs> right? It means that you've got to have times of prayer. And in Philemon, he says, I am always making mention of you in my prayers. He says, in my prayers, which means that he has times of prayer. And we can see from the Bible and from history that the Jews of Paul's day practiced prayers three times a day. 9 a.m. would be the first hour of prayer. Noon, the second, and the third at 3 p.m. Very interesting study I did here. Uh, They based these prayer times upon first Daniel's praying three times a day in Daniel 6, verse 10. David makes reference to prayers in the morning, the evening, and at noon in Psalm 55, verse 17. And they even followed you know, the, the prayers of the three patriarchs. Uh, the scriptures mention Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob praying respectively in the morning, the afternoon, and at night. And these amazingly coincided with the offering of sacrifices and when they were performed. We see in the book of Acts that the disciples practiced these at times as well. We see those in several places in the book of Acts, four different times. And it's interesting to note that these Jewish prayer times also correlate to Jesus' death on the cross. He was crucified at 9 a.m. in Mark 15, 25. Darkness fell over the earth starting at noon. Matthew 27, 45 and other places. And he died at 3 p.m. Matthew 24. 7 verse 46. Now I don't think as New Testament believers we're obligated to follow these specific times of prayer, although that would be wonderful if you could pray three times a day like that, have set aside times. But you do need to have times of prayer. That's one of the primary bases of a relationship, is that you would spend time talking to somebody, and in this case, the most important relationship you can have, which is God, right? In the first part of verse 4, Paul uses the phrase, my God. I think my God. He has a personal relationship. And there's a man named Newt Larson I was reading, and he says, prayer with God was Paul's place of utter abandon." A place where he could fully express his anxieties, concerns, struggles, hopes, and joys. Prayer provided the stable center as well as the surrounding in every relationship and every endeavor. So pray. It's vital. And Paul not only signals to Philemon that he prays, but that there is a place for Philemon in his prayers, and that every time he makes mention of Philemon, he's always thankful. Let me ask you some questions. Do you set aside times for prayer? When you pray, do you have certain believers? in mind that you pray for. You should have some type of a some type of a list, some type of a, a group of believers that you regularly pray for. You can't pray the same level for everybody. But take inventory. See who is in your life. Who are the primary people in your life that you should be praying for? And when you pray for them, do you tell the Lord that you are thankful for them? And if you do this, do you tell them that you pray for them and that you're thankful for them? If you do this, you 
will refresh the hearts of the saints. Well, that's not the only way you can refresh the hearts of the saints. The second way we see in this verse, in these verses, is to love the Lord and be faithful to Him. For you to love the Lord and be faithful to Him will refresh the hearts of the saints. Verse 5. Paul says that he is thankful for Philemon, for Philemon because I hear of your love and the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. There is nothing more that you can do to be refreshing to people than for you to be somebody who loves the Lord and is faithful to Him. Don't you love to be around such people? Your example can influence the hearts of other people. Do you like being around somebody who just loves Jesus? It's just encouraging to see, isn't it? It's it's so encouraging to to have that aroma of Christ around. After all, what are we supposed to be but lovers of Christ? Jesus said that the greatest commandment is this in Matthew 22, 37. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the New Testament reveals to us that Jesus is the Lord. We're to love the Lord. So the greatest thing that a Christian can do is to love Jesus. Now the terms in Matthew 22, verse 37, heart, soul, and mind, these are not mutually exclusive parts of a person. But they are overlapping categories that talk about our immaterial inner person. We have our external flesh and we have our physical hearts, but there is a spiritual, immaterial side of us. And these are categories that describe them. And they picture our love for the Lord is coming from our whole person, every faculty, every capacity, every feeling. Now I give a warning to my uh, seminary students. I usually encourage my seminary students not to talk about Greek unless two things. One, it is helpful. And two, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I'm going to try to use some words that I think will be helpful. And then, by God's grace, I think I know what I'm talking about. But there are three words that are used here. And if you follow them through the New Testament in context with a relationship with God, it's interesting to see the nuances of difference. The first one, uh, loving Christ with all of your mind. If you trace the word here used for mind, it is dianoia, dianoia. And if you trace it throughout the New Testament, it gives us this picture of a person who who loves God. And that involves knowing Jesus and having your mind set on things above. You have your mind set on Him. That's part of your loving Him. You're concerned with His interests. And it means to have His laws and commandments in your mind and you let them renew your mind and transform your thinking. Further, it is to have your mind then prepared for action, as Peter talks about, action to do his will, and it is a mind that looks forward to his coming. So that that kind of sets that up, that perspective of Loving the Lord with your mind. Then loving the Lord with all your heart. If you trace the word cardia, and we think of cardiac when we think of the heart. But spiritually, in relationship to God, it describes a person who who believes in Christ from their heart. A 
person who is repentant. They have a changed heart. Uh, they have God's word as a guide for their conscience that alternately accuses or else defends them. They honor Christ, they trust him, they rejoice, and they do his will. In their hearts, they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of Christ. And from the heart, they cry out to God the Father as Abba, Father. You see the emphasis of the heart? Well, there's also a, a nuance that is a little different with the soul. The word for soul in Greek is psuche. And when we trace this one through the New Testament, we, we find that someone who loves the Lord with their soul finds rest in Him. The soul exalts Christ and the soul is troubled over evil. And it can be strengthened and sanctified. It, the soul hopes and is preserved and purified and shepherded by God and guarded by Christ and entrusted to God. So we're talking about the whole person, the, this wholehearted, this whole soul, this whole minded love for Christ that results in someone who is unswervingly faithful to the Lord. And notice that verse 5 says, I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus. Now, here's an important translation note. The Greek word that's translated faith here in the New American Standard Bible is pistis. It can be translated faith or faithfulness. And I think faithfulness would be better translation here because it's directed toward the Lord... And also to all the saints. And it wouldn't make much sense for someone to have faith toward all the saints. But Paul rather is saying that Philemon has demonstrated love and faithfulness toward the Lord and toward believers. So... If you want to refresh the hearts of Christians in your life, there is nothing better that you can do for someone than to love the Lord and be faithful to Him. That kind of person is going to be refreshing. Somebody who loves the Lord and is faithful to the Lord. Do you want to be that kind of person? So that you can be a refreshment to others. So, pray for people, love the Lord, and be faithful to Him. And the third way you can refresh the hearts of the saints is to love people and to be faithful to them. That's also in verse 5. Again, he says, I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. <clears throat> Very simple. If you want to refresh people... Love them. Love people. Back in Matthew 22, verse 39, Jesus says that the second greatest commandment is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we examine what love looks like in the New Testament, we find, I just have a list here. Listen to these amazing qualities of love for other people. A person who loves is forgiving they are encouraging, compassionate, tolerant. They're kind, humble, and gentle. They're thankful, patient, and edifying. They're unifying, they're truthful, and they're tender hearted. Wouldn't it be refreshing to be around a person like that? And of course, this kind of uh, friend is going to be a faithful person. A loving person is fearful in their commitment and their fidelity. They're fierce. They're loyal. You can trust them. 
Paul had ministry partners named Timothy, Epaphras, Onesimus, and Tychicus that he called faithful. He just looked at their lives and their support and their involvement in ministry with him. He said, these are faithful brothers. Peter saw Sylvanus that way. Someone who is faithful to you is going to be there in the hard times and the good times. They're going to walk with you. They're even bold enough to confront you if necessary. That is a faithful friend because they're putting it on the line. They're risking that relationship by doing so. Listen to a, a, a few proverbs about this concept. In Proverbs 27, verse 5, it says, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. A sated man loathes honey, but to a famished man, any bitter thing is sweet. There's a picture of somebody who needs reproof. And when they get it, it's bitter. Sometimes it's a bitter pill to swallow. But to them, it's sweet. That is a faithful and loving and loyal friend. Are you such a friend? Do you have some of these people that you're praying for and are thankful for and are example, you're trying to be an example of loving the Lord and being faithful and, and you love this friend you're, and you're faithful to them? Do you have people like that in your life that, that you think about being committed to them? A fourth way that you can refresh the hearts of the saints is to fellowship with people. Now, you might think, well, that goes, just goes along with loving and being faithful. Well, you would be right. But Paul specifically mentions this. <clears throat> In verse 6, he says, And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. I was reading that passage to uh, my wife, Myra, and uh, she said, when I got to this verse, I read that verse, she goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's a lot going on in that verse. I said, well, I'll explain it to you in my sermon. <laughs> but let's unpack it a little bit. <clears throat> First, the word fellowship, which is probably one of the main Greek words that most people know, koinonia. But as it's used here, it refers to having shared mutual interests in a close relationship. You have a relationship with people that you have this, this sharing of your interests in the gospel and in Christ. And fellowship is intended to be a huge part of the Christian life. If you are somebody who just comes here on a Sunday morning and then you jet out the door and you don't really interact with believers for the rest of the week, you're missing out on something vitally designed by God for your good, something you need it's for your sanctification, your growth and godliness, your relationship even with God. The center of our fellowship is our shared common faith. And what is our common faith? Well, it involves our belief in Jesus, but it also involves all of that body of doctrine and knowledge that we get from God's Word. All the things that are true about us from God's Word. And we can see right off the bat, the early church practiced this. Acts 2.42 says, They were continually devoting themselves. Get that? They were devoting themselves. Do we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer? Hebrews 10, 24, 25 adds this. It says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another 
to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as, as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's a lot in that verse, but he has the idea there of, of thinking, of considering when we come together and even before we come together, how am I going to stimulate John or Jeff or Judy to love, to practice good deeds in their particular situation, in their circumstance? So the first thing we need to make sure that we are doing when we gather with people is to make sure that we fellowship. The primary topic of our fellowship is said to be by Paul, every good thing you have in Christ. He says... I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. The content of our conversation when we fellowship for genuine true fellowship is to be everything we have in Christ. And the list of that is endless. We can talk about his salvation of our souls. We can think about his redemption of ourselves, his buying of us as his own possession, his paying the price of our redemption with his precious blood. We can talk about his life, which was perfect, and all the miracles that he performed. We can, we can talk about his death on the cross and his sayings. We can talk about his his being buried and then his rising again on the third day. We can, we can talk about the road to Emmaus. We can talk about the, the, his saving of the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. We can talk about the, the giving of the Holy Spirit and his gifting of our lives and the gifts that we have for the mutual encouragement and edification of the body. We can talk about encouraging one another in Christ again. There's just so many things. We talk about inheritance and sealing by the Spirit and predestination and the sovereignty of God, the, the providential working of God through uh, such books as the story of the book of Esther and Ruth. And we can talk about the history of Israel. We can talk about the coming kingdom. We can talk about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who's going to take us to, to be with him forever. We can talk about what heaven will be like and, and we can talk about the horrors of hell and how thankful we are to have been uh, spared that. And we can talk for a long time if we talk about these things. And Paul tells us that that kind of conversation, that kind of sharing, that mutuality in our common topic and relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ can be effective. It can be energizing. He says, I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. Another Greek word for you. Inner gaze kind of sounds like energy. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the writer says, For the word of God is living and active. That's the word inner gaze again. And sharper than any two edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. He talks about how powerful the Word of God is to affect us and to be effective in changing us, in sanctifying us, in enabling us to be more like Jesus Christ. You see, the way that we know every good thing he talks about that is in you for Christ's sake is from the word of God. And as you fellowship around those truths, 
The word of God is living and active in you. And so it's going to be effective. That's wonderful to think about, isn't it? When we come together and we talk about God's word, it's going to be effective to accomplish the work that God wants to accomplish in each one of us. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 13, Paul says, For this reason we constantly thank God. There's he thanking God again for people and what he's done. That when you received the word of God you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. And listen to this which also performs its work. And that's the verb in our ghetto. Performs its work in you who believe. It's exciting to think, do you believe that, that the word of God will actually change you? Because it is God's word. He is speaking to us when we read it, when we hear it, and when we fellowship with it. effective and the the work it accomplishes as we talk about it in 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 17 it tells us all scripture is inspired by God it is a divine product and it is profitable for teaching for reproof for correction for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work Now, let's not miss the little phrase at the end of Philemon verse 6. All of this is for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. When we fellowship, it is for the Lord. Christ has purchased every one of us with his precious blood. We are his. And he wants us to become holy and blameless. And he has provided fellowship as one of the means through which we would be made more like him. It's to his glory. It's for his purpose. It's for his praise. Let me ask you again. Do you fellowship with people? And if you don't know how to fellowship, let me give you five ways. First, you have to get together. <laughs> you have to actually get together to fellowship. And this, this may happen at church. It may happen in a particular church ministry or an event. It could be a small group, a discipleship meeting, a soul care group. Uh, it may be through just intentionally hanging out with somebody. Hey, let's, can you guys come over to our house? Don't everybody say yes, we don't have enough food. <laughs> But you specifically ask somebody, ask another family over, another person, go to lunch with somebody, go to breakfast. In verse 21, Paul asked Philemon to prepare him a place to stay. He anticipates when he gets to come and see Philemon that it's going to be a wonderful time of fellowship. Just refreshing hearts. Some of the best times of fellowship I've had are when I'm traveling and we stop by to see some friend or some family that we've known and they let us stay with them. And you just stay up and talk and, and just fellowship. It's sweet. So first of all, you have to gather, get together. And second, you need to talk about the Lord. Talk about His Word. Talk about doctrine. Talk about how it applies to your life. Talk about what you're going through. Third, share testimonies and talk about what is going on in your lives. I love that. Sometimes we're sitting around the table, we're having people over, and I just say, you know, give us your testimony. Tell us how you came to know the Lord Jesus. Sometimes I go beyond that. I'll say, tell me your story, your life story. I usually do that for younger people, but. So, you know, you get together, you, you talk about the Lord, you talk about what you're going through. 
Then you practice, fourth, you practice your one another's. You encourage one another. You exhort one another. You maybe reprove or correct or teach one another. And then fifth, pray together. When you get together, spend some time praying to, together. That's encouraging. So in, in order to refresh the hearts of people, pray for people. And when you pray, thank God for people and tell people that you pray for them and are thankful for them. Then be a person who loves the Lord and is faithful to Him and somebody who loves people and are faithful to them. And be somebody who fellowships with them. And finally, give people joy and comfort. Verse 7. Paul says, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. He hones in, he, he focuses on two elements of that fellowship and that refreshment, joy and comfort. This reminds me of uh, Paul's admonition in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, where he says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Rejoicing and comfort. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, it says, If one member suffers... All suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. The only way we can do this is to have the kind of fellowship, the kind of relationships where we get to know others' victories and struggles, where we get to know one another's sorrows and joys. If we follow Philemon's example here in in this book, then we will be refreshing the hearts of people, first of all, by giving them lots of joy. Don't you want to just be somebody who just gives somebody a lot of joy? We need to look for opportunities to enter into the joy of others. One of the best ways to do this is listening to their prayer and then answers to prayer. So if you're praying for somebody... And then you go back to them and you say, well, how's the Lord doing in that situation you talked about? You shared with me to pray for you in this particular situation. And so how's that going? What has God done? And then when they share how God's answered, you say, wow, that's amazing. That's miraculous. Let's rejoice about that. Let's praise the Lord. And you, and you help them to pray to praise the Lord, to give thanks, to rejoice, to be happy. All those things. You also want to give people a lot of comfort. Paul says, I've come to have much comfort in your love. Our hearts need to be made to rejoice, but they also need to be comforted. We need to provide, as a big part of our ministry and our fellowship to comfort the hearts of people who are grieving, who are weeping. Jesus was a perfect example of this when he went to the home of Lazarus who had died and Martha and Mary are grieving. And it says Jesus wept. He wept with them. And then he raised Lazarus from the grave. I want to take you to 2 Corinthians 1 for the last passage in this passage, you see kind of a cycle of comfort that should be part of our mutuality in fellowship. Paul, first of all, points to the person that we get the greatest comfort from. And he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort need to let people know that there is a source of comfort in their trial. And that is the God of all comfort. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, that's Paul and his traveling companions, so that we will be able to comfort those 
who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You see that cycle, that circle going around? You know, God comforts us, we comfort you. God comforts you, you comfort us. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. My desire for you this morning is that you would be a Philemon. By God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the only way this can be accomplished, that you would be somebody that is described in this way. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother or sister. And remember Proverbs 11.25, which tells us that whoever refreshes someone will be refreshed. Let's pray. And men, would you come and prepare the table? Lord, we know that all refreshment ultimately comes from you. Whether it is that you would... Rejoice our hearts or give us comfort or demonstrate love to us. We are thankful, Lord, that you do this, that you care. We're thankful that you have given us the body of Christ. We're not alone in this. And I pray that you will help people here by your spirit to empower them to pray for others to be thankful for them. Help each person here to love you, Lord, with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love their neighbor as themselves, and to be faithful as friends and faithful as Christians. Help them to to fellowship and to, to gather, to share. And then as we see the victories, that we would rejoice. And as we see the sorrows, that we would weep, and bring comfort. You have done an amazing thing in equipping us to do these things through your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God has given us a supper for us to commune with him. But it is also a time when we remember that we're part of this body. It's a refreshing time for us to have our hearts renewed, stimulated to be committed to him and to one another. One of my favorite passages for communion is Luke 24, probably an an odd one to many people. For this, but as Jesus is walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he was explaining to them the scriptures concerning himself, it says, And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. Notice they're having fellowship with the Lord. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Wow. What an amazing thing. He was recognized in the breaking of the bread. He had done that before. Disciples had seen him. 
And they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen, and he appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. That's what I hope for you as we fellowship around the table, around the elements that remind us of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. That your hearts would be refreshed, that you would be, have your heart burning within you with a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Men, would you come and serve us?
preparation, go ahead and peel back that uh, plastic layer on the top to gain the wafer underneath. When we think about this piece of bread represents the body of Christ, but not just his physical body that died on the cross and was resurrected, but also we can think of all these pieces as gathered back together into one loaf, and that represents the church, the body of Christ, all of the members of it. And so when we think about this, we, we meditate on the part that, that we're in Christ and that we are to think about in the 1 Corinthians 11 uh, section where it talks about the Lord's Supper, they're having problems thinking about one another rightly as Pastor Scott's been teaching on. And so when we come together, we ought to be thinking about other people and implementing what Philemon taught us today about that thanking God for other people in the body. So let's think not just about that, though. Let's refresh our hearts thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and that he died in our place upon the cross. And we are declared to be righteous because of his work through faith alone in him. Let's take this together. Of course, peel, peel back the next layer for the fruit of the vine that reminds us of the price that was paid. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But hallelujah, because of the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross, we have the forgiveness of sins, right? You're forgiven for everything. If you're a believer who has... Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't that powerful? Doesn't that refresh your heart? I know I've sinned this week, and I need that refreshing reminder that I'm not condemned. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So let's rejoice as we take this cup together. Please stand with me. Let's close in prayer. Father, a lot's been said. My desire is simply that the hearts of these people here today would be refreshed with you, with your word, and by one another. And that each person will be transformed into a more refreshing person. That we be mindful of the body of Christ. And Lord, we pray that this would be for Christ's sake, that by your Spirit we'd be enabled to thank you, to praise you, to glorify you in all that we do. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed.